Welcome everybody to this uh, uh, session on uh, treatment of the aortic stenosis today and looking at the future. I think we will uh, have uh, very interesting discussions today trying to focus on how to achieve optimal outcomes in our patients today and, and what will happen in the future. Uh, I think uh, we all expect a big improvement in the next uh, few hopefully weeks or months, uh, having a, a new delivery system that will be the FlexNav uh, coming. At, at this time, uh, we have the data from the IDE study in the United States. This is one of the unfortunate situations where you come from the United States, you teach us what to do, and it's, it's happening now. It was uh, not happening f uh, before, but it's happening now. I think I'm, I'm very happy to uh, to, have, uh, to have the first initial impression from, uh, from, uh, from this study. We had uh, also in our hospital the opportunity to try the FlexNav system and uh, really it will create a lot of uh, improvement in our practice. Um, without further delay, I think we can start a bit earlier so we have more time for discussion. So I wish you a good session and I invite Raj to give the first lecture. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Francesco. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, so I'm going to give you uh, uh, the data on the, um, the latest data and clinical implications with the portico uh, valve with the FlexNav uh, uh, delivery system. So these are my uh, disclosures, and I think an important disclosure is that uh, I was one of the co-PIs with Greg Fontana on the portico ID study. I'm supposed to tell you that Portico with FlexNav TAVI system is pending CE mark and that this product is not yet available for sale. So the Portico ID trial is a global multi-center um, study, you know, with 70 sites. It was a prospective trial, randomized, controlled, and the, the, the design was uh, essentially a non-inferiority trial uh, compared to the commercial valves. So patients who were either high or extreme surgical risk with severe aortic stenosis and the annulus between 19 and 27 millimeters were treated either using transfemoral or alternate access. Um, so th there are two parts of this. There's the pivotal study, which is 750 patients where patients were randomized one to one. 381 patients got uh, the portico valve uh, with the first generation delivery system, so that was not the FlexNAP system. And then um, 369 patients were uh, randomized to receive any FDA-approved commercial TAVR system. And you can actually see the breakup of the different commercial valves that were uh, used there. <clears throat> so, um, uh, you know, here is the timeline. Essentially, um, you know, the enrollment started in the middle of 2014. Then we had a pause, which was related to the issue of uh, leaflet motion abnormalities, which was um, uh, nicely sorted out. And then, of course, the enroll enrollment completed in uh, 2017, uh, following which we had continued access registry. And then uh, towards the end uh, is when the FlexNav uh, uh, delivery system cohort started to enroll patients. So a little bit about the original ID study. The, the primary safety endpoint of the pivotal uh, randomized clinical trial was a, a combination. It was a composite safety endpoint at 30 days of all-cause mortality, disabling stroke, life-threatening bleeding, required transfusion, acute kin kidney injury, uh, requiring dialysis, and major vascular complication. And when we first uh, designed this study and, and powered this study, essentially it was based on the, out, uh, the data that we had from the Partner 1 trial. and and the core valve pivotal, um, uh, you know, uh, early studies. So both cohorts performed really well. You know, the incidence of, uh, compared to what was expected, um, uh, uh, you know, which was the 30.8%, uh, the numbers that were observed with the uh, portico were 13.8, um, and uh, with the commercial valve was 9.6% of this composite safety event. Um, and based on a predefined non-inferiority margin, this, this goal was achieved um, uh, and essentially 
the outcomes in terms of primary safety endpoint were considered to be non-inferior. Um, now, uh, looking at the primary efficacy endpoint, it was a combination of uh, death and disabling uh, stroke. Uh, and if you look at the outcomes, once again, they were quite similar. It was 13.4% with the uh, commercial valves and 14.9% with the portico uh, valve, uh, and uh, looking at the uh, mean, the mean difference was 1.5%, and the one-sided 95% uh, confidence, uh, upper confidence bound was 5.7, so on a pre-specified, um, a predefined uh, non-inferiority margin of 8%, this was also attained. So both uh, in terms of safety and in terms of primary effectiveness, um, the trial met uh, the non-inferiority endpoints. Now here is the breakup of the, uh, of the uh, clinical events. So of course, we did uh, attain non-inferiority, but it was also clear that the vascular complications were actually higher, uh, uh, and essentially that was a significant contributor to the delta between the commercial and the portico valve in the safety endpoints. Um, and if you look at the pacemaker implantation rates, they were also 27.7% with the portico trial compared to 11.6% with the uh, commercial valve. So this was a combination of the sapien valve as well as uh, the um, self-expanding valves. Um, so uh, the, the moderate or greater PV leak rates were 6.3% in portico and 2.1% uh, in the commercial valves. So uh, I think with that intent, with the idea of improving the outcomes further is how we actually now move on to the FlexNav uh, uh, delivery uh, uh, system cohort. So these are uh, 100 patients that were actually uh, enrolled. Now what is different about the FlexNav system is that it is unlike the old system which was introduced through an 18 or 19 French sheet, this is a 14 or 15 French uh, system. Um, it basically has an integrated sheath or, uh, you know, uh, and it has a stability layer which allows the placement of the valve to be much more accurate. So the valve doesn't migrate down, uh, also has a hydrophilic uh, coating and of course the handle has been uh, redesigned. So I think the biggest difference here was the smaller profile in addition to the more accurate uh, placement of the system. So this was, of course, not a randomized. This was a, um, a prospective multi-center single arm uh, uh, registry that we embedded in the IDE study, uh, uh, looking all, uh, again at symptomatic severe ES at high or extreme risk uh, patients. And the primary endpoints, since our goal was to essentially make sure that we're reducing vascular complications, the VARC to major uh, vascular complication at 30 days was the primary endpoint. The rest of the inclusion exclusion criteria were absolutely similar to the ex, uh, to the IDE study. So it's fair, relatively fair, to make the comparisons with the FlexNav to the other data in the um, uh, in the IDE study. So these are the data. I think I'm happy to report that all cause mortality was zero percent, cardiovascular mortality was zero percent, stroke was zero percent life-threatening bleeding um, uh, requiring transfusions, 4%, acute kidney injury, 0%. So I think these are very favorable outcomes. The vascular complication rates were 7%, so you can, you can see they were down from what was about 9.6%. Um, the pacemaker rates had actually come down to 14.6%. The PV leak rates are 6.5%. So I think if you, if you now uh, look at the FlexNav cohort and, combine, and, and compare it to the portico valve. So essentially it's the same valve, but with a different delivery system. You can see the improvement in the different endpoints. Uh, you know, you can see the differences in mortality. You can see the differences in stroke. Um, the pacemaker rates, uh, of course, uh, uh, they're all sort of uh, shown here, okay? so. Um, now, looking at some of these things individually in a little bit more detail, you can see that the pacemaker rates with the flex navas was 14.6% compared to 27.7%, uh, you know, with the portico. Uh, and then if you look at the portico one registry, which was uh, almost in 1,000 patients, the pacemaker rates were about 19%. So I think this is very favorable, suggesting that the new delivery system was able to deliver the valve at less depth, 
So the depth in the uh, FlexNav cohort was four millimeters compared to 6.4 millimeters uh, in the ID and 5.4 millimeters in the portico one registry, suggesting that the depth has something to do in terms of pacemaker uh, rates. So here is basically, the question comes up, how, since this was a combination of different types of valves, and this is not a randomized comparison, so you, you can argue that this may not be scientifically um, uh, all that rigorous, but I think it nonetheless actually fares a reasonable comparison since the inclusion-exclusion criteria and anatomical criteria were, very, were exactly the same. And if you look at the comparison of FlexNav with what is used today, which is either Evolute R or Pro or Sapien 3, uh, you can look at the comparisons, uh, and I think they seem to be quite good in terms of mortality and stroke and some of the other uh, vascular complications. You can see actually they were quite same, similar, 7%, 6.4%, 7.3%. The balloon expandable valve was clearly better than the two um, uh, self-expanding valves in terms of pacemaker requirement, and of course, uh, also in terms of uh, the uh, paravalvular aortic regurgitation. But clearly, this is, these data are quite competitive uh, and uh, you know, comparable to what is actually being used today in the clinical setting. Uh, and once again, if you go back to the original um, uh, endpoint, the safety endpoint, which was the composite of all of these things, um, you, can, you can see that there was not much difference between what the contemporary valves are uh, and, and the FlexNav you know, in, in 100 patients. So this is the PV leak. So I think that the PV leak rates were higher, and I think we have to acknowledge that in the um, in the IDE and also in the FlexNav, and that was 6.5 percent. But I think there is there is explanation here. I think if you look at the real life registry, the Portico One registry, uh, uh, where an analysis was done, where the the rates were actually 3.9 percent by the same core lab that actually adjudicated PV leak in the ID registry. What you can also see here is that experience counts, and once you've done a certain number of cases, if you've done more than centers that have done 15 implants, we're able to position this better and we're able to lower uh, the PV leak rates. And I think it's important to remember that whenever you are doing this device-to-device -device studies, you're not just comparing one device against another device, you're also comparing the device to the experience that has been amassed by a uh, much larger experience with the older uh, devices that have been on the market uh, much longer. Uh, the hemodynamic data were of great interest to us, and if you look at the comparison of uh, Portico with the Evolute, it was surprising to see that uh, despite being an intraannular valve, the valve areas were actually more like a supraannular valve, 1.83 um, compared to 1.93 with Evolute, and if you look at, uh, you know, so these comparisons with Evolute and Sapien are actually there. Slightly less uh, valve areas uh, compared to the uh, Evolute and greater valve areas compared to the intraannular balloon expandable uh, valve. So to summarize, I think uh, what, what was what was encouraging about the small uh, but still a rigorously conducted uh, the portico um, uh, flex nav registry was that we saw no deaths, disabling strokes, or acute kidney injury. The vascular complications, we were able to bring them down uh, somewhat, yeah, I think down from 95 to 7%, which are very consistent with the other. Uh, other valves, the safety profile was consistent in a composite endpoint, and the uh, gradients were down to low, uh, you know, to like six or seven millimeters of mercury with uh, significantly large valve areas. So I think that's, uh, you know, um, that was a very novel observation because uh, till now we've always attributed uh, bigger valve areas to supraannular design. But nonetheless, we did observe this. I think uh, the, the issue of PVL can be addressed by greater experience. And also, with the next generation portico, which is currently being tested right now, which has a ceiling skirt for uh, PV leaks. Um, and uh, of course, I've already mentioned to you about the, uh, the hemodynamics. So thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you, Raj. You can uh, probably sit uh, here with us. I would like to have a quick reaction from uh, Axel. I mean, we are uh, in Europe, we are a bit behind. 
but you have already had some hands on the, the, the delivery system. So what has it been your uh, experience? I mean, um, I have employed a couple of, uh, of valves. And <clears throat> you know, with the, with the previous system, the, the implant is, uh, despite of this, reliable. I mean, it just, you know, every system needs a special kind of training. And I'm completely with Rush. You know, if you have experienced more than 50 cases, you are able to place the valve adequately. You don't have an issue of PV leak. And our own experience, the pacemaker rates are also lower. So this is, you know, if you have training, then the valve is great. OK, so let's move forward. The next uh, presentation will be exactly on a pacemaker implantation. All the baker will uh, uh, talk ab about reducing pacemaker rating target. Yeah. Well, I will try to say something about this topic. So indeed, conduction disturbances, both which leading to permanent pacemaker implantation, but also just left, having a left bundle branch block, they are rather frequent. And they are not always benign uh, complications, actually, of uh, TAVR. And this risk is, of course, determined by a complex interplay, both by the patient substrate, so the membrane septum length of your patient, also how much is calcification is there in that LVOT, is there pre-existing right bone branch block. So these are patient uh, characteristics which you cannot change. But you can change, and you do have influence as an operator on the procedural fac factors which are balloon uh, valve velocity or pre-dilatation before the device uh, selection, the, the oversizing, if you would do it uh, in a more aggressive way or not, the implant depth. So these are modifiable factors. And just very brief, it's just one slide. So we know that this membrane is septum, which is typically going between the non and the right coronary cusp, that this inferior border of that membrane septum is important, that the maximum contact pressure there executed by your uh, transcathetic heart valve uh, is important in determining whether your patient will develop a bundle branch block or maybe even a full block, total block, and, and needing a pacemaker. So I've tried to list it up to, uh, very briefly, like which are the procedural factors impacting this contact pressure or potential damage to the conduction system. Very brief, something about pre-dilatation, valve type, valve sizing, valve repositioning, implant depth, and post-dilatation. So pre-dilatation, it's rather rare that you induce uh, permanent uh, conduction disturbances by pre-dilatation, but this is definitely, you see everybody's doing, Tavi uh, has seen this from time to time. So it's, of course, also depending uh, whether you should do pre-dilatation or not, is depending on the amount of calcium in the leaflets, at least for me, if I would do it, yes or no. Also, depending on the choice of TAVI valve you're going to implant, I would say, personally, I, I use least uh, pre-dilatation when using a Sapien, uh, a little bit more when using Evolute, uh, even uh, more when using Lotus, and the more in the Portico and Accurate. I come later back on this, why I do this. And then your choice of balloon size, uh, it's maybe a wise idea to match it to the, the minimum diameter of your analyst. If you go uh, higher than this, then you might, may induce more damage to the conduction system. Valve type, valve sizing. Again, I won't go in detail here, uh, which is maybe interesting, the valve design. I think it's important to see that the portico has a very straight uh, body of the stand frame, while other, uh, the Evolute platform, uh, which is the other self-expanding platform, has more tapered um, the valve design. So there, to my understanding, this may induce a little bit more uh, pressure on the conduction systems. And then also, if you talk about sizing, I think uh, overly oversizing should be avoided. Also, if you look to the different uh, sizing charts, you see that you have to be careful, Evolute 29 or Portico 29. If you look to the perimeters, what the official instructions for use are from the company, so the Evolute 29 covers a perimeter between 72 to 82, while uh, the Portico between 79 and 85. So you cannot just uh, take the same sizing chart uh, for Evolute and uh, implement this in the portico. Repositioning, very brief, I think indeed it can potentially be good in order to obtain a better or a more optimal implant position. But I would say uh, here the last sentence, the number of repositionings should be kept to a minimum. You should still start your procedure, not with the mental, uh, with the mindset that, okay, fine, I just go here, try, and if we, I have to reposition, I reposition. No, I, 
always try to go from the first shots in a good position. Because I think theoretically there's also more risk of dislocation of calcium debris and increased stroke risk, but also, also this injury to AV conduction system. So if you have a too low implant, and even if you reposition, this may give permanent damage to your condu conduction system. So I think do everything to have during your first deployment an optimal position. Implant depth in relation to the membrane septum, that is, is important, that has been proven by different people. Also, this is our own data from Copenhagen, showing that indeed if you have your valve implanted uh, much deeper than the membrane septum, that you have a much higher uh, uh, risk for conduction abnormalities. So about this implantation, that may be a few more words. There, there's a lot to do here uh, also on, in uh, London Valves about this cusp overlap view. So what is this exactly for the people in the audience who, who want to hear something more about this? So very often we are used to implant more in an LAO uh, view, and it depends from operator or institution to institution, but we like to um, align our portico transcatheter heart valve when we do a portico implant. So then we end up very often in an LAO caudal view. Anyway, if we go to more a cusp overlap view in an REO caudal view, this may be beneficial. As uh, in this REO caudal view, we typically elongate the LVOT so we can much more accurately uh, assess the depth of our implants. So in an LAO view, that's why I wrote in an LAO view, the actual implant depth gets systematically underestimated. So very often if you do your deployment in an LAO view, you think you're about two millimeters height, you go to an REO view and you check, you, you see that you're actually more at three, four millimeter. So you, you see it uh, foreshortened uh, in, in an, uh, in an L L LAO view and you see it elongated, the LVOT in an REO view. So that's why in an REO caudal view, typically also this is a good uh, view because there the double S curves will cross. So we will have, this means we will have alignment of both the transcatheter heart valve and the aortic annulus plane. So people tend to do more and more implants in this REO caudal view. Then something about post dilatation. Well, I, I would say, of course, only post dilate if freely necessary. For me, it's typically when there is uh, just an unacceptable uh, degree of uh, PVL. That's the only reason, typically, why I post dilate. Balloon size, uh, the maximum balloon size, I never go above the perimeter derived mean diameter. That's my absolute uh, max uh, size of my post dilatation balloon. And then the height of the balloon, I would say sometimes uh, if you see uh, post dilatations from recorded cases, this balloon goes very deep in this LVOT. I would say I try to avoid this. I typically just come out a few millimeters uh, distal uh, in the LVOT. Very short, maybe I don't have the time for this. Very short, uh, some rates from the newer generations of valves. You see Sapien XT or Sapien 3. Sapien 3 has went a little bit up in rates. It went, it's more about around 10 to 15% in real, real world uh, practice. Uh, Evolute platform is having uh, a pacemaker rates around this uh, 18 or 16 to 18 percent. Accurate valve is one of the valves with the lower pacemaker rates, I would say, around uh, 10 percent. Lotus, of course, famous for this uh, higher uh, pacemaker rate uh, above 30. Now they try to do something about it with the Lotus Edge and the newer implantation technique, but this, there's no data on this yet. And then this Portico data, this is from Portico 1, which was already shown. So you can see that the, the overall uh, rate was around 18%. Um, this was, of course, sites with more or less than 15 implants. I would say 15 implants is simply not enough to, to call you an experienced uh, implanter. Um, but you see there's a, maybe a small tendency to have around this 18% uh, implantation rate. But then I would like you to show also these data from our, uh, my own center. Um, from the Copenhagen data. So this is the first 100 cases. So I would say these are my learning curves or, or as a center learning curve uh, cases. This is the second uh, 50% um, of cases. And you see that in the first 50, half of our cases, we had around this 20% uh, uh, pacemaker rate. In the second half, we only had 11%. And that's now also continued in our portico implants. It's around 11 to 13%. Um, in, eight, in 17 and 18, that was where our implant uh, pacemaker rates for uh, Portico. What's interesting to see here that you see that in the first half of the first 100 cases, we didn't use predilatation that much. Now we use almost systematically predilatation in every case I do with uh, Portico. And I think this is really an important thing because this has also um, resulted in less repositioning and being able to place this valve higher. 
I was, in a way, scared to in, in, uh, implant the valve on a very high, uh, just two millimeter depth in the past, because sometimes the valve uh, needed uh, much more post dilatation or you may risk a pop-up. But if you do more cons consistently a pre-dilatation, you need less post dilatation. Our post dilatation went from 35% to 15%, so it, it was in, we need less post dilatation in our cases, and we can place our valve more, more controlled in a higher position. So this is maybe a most important message I want to give here. Um, then the last two slides, uh, which were also already shown uh, by Raj Makar about the Portico IDE. So you see that with the flex now uh, catheter, we can also have a more controlled positioning. Um, and I have a personal experience with this in a few cases already, and it makes a real difference. The valve has less tendency to dive into the LVOT. You have a more controlled positioning of your, of your valve. So that's something promising for the future, and I think uh, with this uh, new uh, FlexNow catheter and also maybe the optimized understanding of the valve, these pacemaker rates will come to everybody who uses it, come down to 10 to 15% uh, range. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Well, it's great to see we're making uh, some progress with pacemakers, but still uh, maybe around 10% is uh, best in class. Sometimes we get down to single digits, and it's curious to me, uh, a lot of very experienced operators consistently can keep in almost any of the valves below 10%. Um, below, uh, so Raj, for a pacemaker, what, uh, what is your, your strategy? Are you trying to land all the valves uh, at two millimeters, uh, whatever you're doing, in particular portico or other self-expanding valves? Yeah, I mean, I think um, to be as high as I can. And I think one of the things that you're always concerned about when you're doing a self-expanding valves is that if you're too high, it'll pop up. So I think the whole technique of pre-dilating is a good one. I think, uh, you know, you're, you're a little bit uh, confident. but. Uh, I think the, the, the goal is to land it as high as you can. The depth was four millimeters in the flex nav, which is where we saw the pacemaker rates um, to be around, you know, 14%. So I think, uh, and when I'm doing a balloon expandable valve, I often land it at one or even zero. I think it's, it's become a very common practice where you can actually drive down the pacemaker rates to about 3%, you know, 3 or 4%. Francesco, do you worry about pre-dilatation uh, routinely? Does that, does that bothersome to you? I'm happy to hear that uh, in Copenhagen now you do it uh, in every patient because this was a big discussion between the two of us. We, we have been always pre-dilating every patient, in every patient. Um, initially, I have to say a little bit more aggressively than today. Today we tend to downsize 20% to the nominal uh, uh, perimeter diameter, per perimeter derived, uh, derived perimeter because I think uh, this way we try to preserve the conduction tissue a bit more. But I think uh, a pre-dilatation is fundamental in Portico because it's a, it's a valve with less metal. You need to, you know, obviously it's, it's, uh, the, the expansion force is less than other uh, self-expanding devices. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of advantages in having less metal, but uh, this is one of the disadvantages and needs a pre-dilatation. With that, the, 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 this valve really achieves great results. Mm -hmm. We're very happy with, uh, with this platform, is, uh, but it requires a specific uh, uh, training and, and knowledge, and I agree with all of that. Uh, 15 cases have not been my learning curve. My learning curve at the beginning has been more than 40, uh, particularly because of the, uh, of the influence from other uh, valve experience. And we have we have to develop the, a new uh, standard practice. And I think at, at the moment we're getting there, and I think that having a, a more stable delivery system will also help other users. Do you think the FlexNav system may shorten the learning curve? What's your thoughts? Well, we have to first of all deliver a new learning curve because we have a new device. Again, I think it will uh, for sure make uh, more predictable the behavior of the of the delivery. All right, great. Well, let's move on and go on to vascular complications. Can we reduce them? I know you have some great strategies, Francesco, so looking forward to hearing. Uh, so first of all, I am abusing the position of Maurizio Taramasso because Maurizio was supposed to be this, the, the lecture, but uh, he's in Zurich doing the leftover from the live cases, so I'm here in, uh, on his behalf. Um, and I want to share with you our experience in, uh, in, uh, in this field. Uh, just. Uh, 
reminding you that the problem of vascular complication is going down. It's uh, less and less in the, in the modern era. Uh, for those who have been doing TAVI in the, in the early 2007, 8 uh, uh, complications were 30, 40 percent of the cases. I would say almost every case was a bit of uh, suffering. Uh, today, there is much less of this, but still, uh, uh, access complication remain a problem and they are associated with morbidity and, uh, and cost. So, uh, let's take one example of a study where there was a very small, uh, uh, very low rate of uh, vascular complication. The part the three shows uh, two percent rate of complication. Be very careful. This, this has been a, a very highly selected population. And if you look at, for instance, and uh, the Portico registry, we have seen several times now uh, numbers that range between five and seven percent. In the Portico registry, we had a rate of ma major vascular complication of five percent. Very important to, to remind, registries are all comers and trials are highly selected patients and, and vascular, uh, vascular issues were one of the main reasons to uh, turn down patients for the, uh, for, for the part of three, for instance. So for, when you go in, in, in the literature, look for comparison, this is a, a, a direct comparison of portico versus balloon expandable sapient devices and you see basically the same rate of complications. So vascular complication about 5%. In our own experience, we had much lower rate of complication, and this is, a, to some extent, good luck as well, because some of these complications, at the end of the day, may be just a, a, a prostate failure, prolife failure, uh, just a puncture site complication. But still, we observe low rate of complication with this with this device, which has, by the way, been used mostly in patients with difficult access. We love Portigo because it's more flexible, more deliverable. Uh, the fact that there is less metal makes this, uh, this, the, this valve easier to be uh, delivered in complex anatomies. Whenever we have a difficult groin, we go for Portigo. So it's a highly selected, high-risk population here. And still, in this population, we were able to have low risk because we, uh, we always use Portigo sheetless. All patients have been always treated sheetless in our, in our case. Um, only probably two or three have been done with a sheet only in presence of, of a freshly implanted EVAR. So what, I, what have been the strategies in our hospital to try to reduce vascular complication? Nothing special, I think we all know this, uh, this concept. First of all, patient selection, uh, CT planning, uh, using precise technique for, uh, for puncturing, uh, preventing difficult cases with, uh, with crossover, going sheetless, and obviously being very uh, uh, careful. So first of all, I would like to mention uh, CT scan, uh, patient selection and planning. And we know this uh, triad, this rule that you, can, you have three problems with femoral axis. One is the size, one is the tortuosity, one is the calcification. And we have been uh, taught at the very beginning that uh, you can accept one of the three, and if one of the three is there, you can uh, still go transfemoral, let's say very calcified uh, vessel, but uh, non tortuous and uh, big size, who cares? Uh, the reality is that we are very careful in those patients who have only small size. If you have a very small size vessel, uh, this is a very highly uh, risk situation. You may have uh, this kind of complications. We have seen it. Uh, for those who don't know what it is, it's not a vein uh, graft. This is an iliac on the stick after it's been removed from the stick. So you can get out with the full iliac in your hands. So, and this happens, if you look at this iliac, is an iliac which is absolutely non-calcified and uh, is a typical case of, uh, of an old lady with uh, normal iliac uh, uh, anatomy, just a small. These patients, really profit from a sheetless approach where you have a very small profile and uh, no contact with the, with the vessel, with uh, the sheet or during the procedure. So the, the risk of having the, uh, the spasm of the iliac over the sheet is gone. 
is not only uh, obviously a small profile, so I have to be sure to achieve an alternative access in case uh, the anatomy is prohibitive. And obviously, uh, I put this slide I presented in 2010 at TCT, where we were discussing about uh, the need of an alternative route in about 20, 30% of study. Today is not anymore the case. Probably less than 5% of our patients require, uh, actually it's 3% of our patients require alternative access. Uh, whatever it is in your practice, in our practice, it is subclavian, we're very happy about that. Uh, but there are patients where you need to go alternative access. Our recipe in Zurich is uh, uh, local anesthesia, uh, axillary access, which can be done very, very uh, simply. I don't want to go through all the details, but basically we have a, a technique that I learned from, uh, actually from Jean-Claude Laborde, so interventional cardiology uh, told me what to do for uh, obtain a good puncture. And actually, this is a trick here a longitudinal purse string that allow uh, no constriction of the artery afterwards. Uh, you have uh, a precise uh, introduction of sheets through a controlled opening with a knife so that the thing remains in place. So when you do this uh, correctly, also uh, subclavian is a very simple procedure. And I just want to show you uh, one uh, extreme example. This is a center which has been using subclavian access as a primary access. And look at the complication rate in the transfemoral group, which is zero. So it's obviously here. It's obviously an extreme example that if you are careful in selecting the patients and you uh, use all your armamentarium, you can reduce complications. If you go femoral, uh, we learned in the last uh, uh, year to be more and more careful. Micropuncture is not new. I remember I was working with Antonio Colombo, Antonio uh, in, uh, in San Raffaele, uh, working with us, uh, was working just normal. In the private clinic, he was doing micropuncture in e each and every patient to have a safe access and have no complications. So micropuncture remains a very important issue. We combine micropuncture eco-guided. So really, we try to get the best the best uh, puncture possible, going really in, in the anterior part of the, of the artery. I will not go through all the details of this video, but actually we go in all patients uh, with echo-guided micropuncture. And in those patients where you have a specific uh, uh, complex anatomy and a risk of, uh, of complications, again, we use portico in all complex femorals. So uh, in those patients we still uh, use uh, very liberally crossover, sometimes, uh, as in this case, same side access uh, or crossover. And I just posted on LinkedIn this technique I want to show you because I it's a very simple technique for crossover. If you have problems in crossover, you know, very simple, use whatever you want, but bend your wire. You bend the wire, and uh, this will allow you to cross very easily. You show you what happened. This is an extreme anatomy. And the, with a banded wire, this is a V18 banded. You can uh, uh, easily cross over even if uh, in, uh, in really tortuous anatomies, calcified anatomies, and a, a very steep angle. This is an example. And you can get it on LinkedIn if you want. Then sheetless, uh, I mean, you have now two, three months to use this uh, technique because hopefully uh, we come with, uh, with uh, the, uh, the, the uh, new delivery system in FlexNav, it will not be any more necessary. But basically to do sheetless, uh, you just have to use uh, two proglides so that once the nose cone, uh, uh, once the capsule will be inserted in the femoral, you will use one of the two proglides to secure the access because the shaft is a bit smaller. Again, with FlexNav, will be, there will be an online inline sheet, so it will be not necessary. But obviously, using a sheetless approach, you really have the, sh the smallest profile in the market at the moment with uh, Tavi. So it really allows you a very small uh, 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 puncture site and combined with, uh, combined with uh, the extreme flexibility of the capsule, you have really one of the devices, probably the device which delivers is easiest than any other. And this is the size that you have if you go portico solo uh, compared to any other device in the market. Again, this is the last slide. 
the sheetless approach will be evoluted, evolved in, in the, with the FlexNav, will be much simplified, and I'm sure that will uh, improve even more the vascular complications. Thank you for your attention. That was a great talk. Thanks, Francesco. Axel, uh, any other um, tips or tricks on, on vascular complication reduction you can share with us? I mean, um, uh, basically, it's selection of the patient is a key, as you mentioned. You know, if you're trying to push the limits, then you will have vascular complications. If there's an alternative vascular excess that is not calcified, that's probably the way to go. And then an alternative to the ultrasound guided puncture is to place a you know, four-fanch pigtail into the vessel and then just stick into the middle of the pigtail. And then you, have, you make sure that you really hit the vessel at the anterior aspect and gives you nice control. This is just an alternative. Raj? I think uh, Francesco alluded to using the micropuncture. I think that's very, very helpful, especially when you're working with fellow uh, fellows and training them. But I think even otherwise, I think it's the right thing to do. The other important thing to do is to make sure that you are puncturing the artery not on top of the artery, not from the side of the artery. And I think, uh, and you could do that by either having a pigtail catheter or by using ultrasound. So I think, you know, so you, or you're doing a contralateral injection as you're puncturing the artery, you know, with an up and over catheter. So I think those are some of the, those are the two most important things I would talk about. You know, ultrasound puncture, uh, it, it, when I was a non-believer, I said, uh, you know, I don't need it. You know, and actually, as you start doing it and you get used to it, I will never puncture an artery without an ultrasound anymore. You have so much precision, the anterior wall, you can see exactly where you puncture. So it, it, there is a learning curve as well there. But uh, I think is, uh, it's something that I, I suggest everybody really to, to experiment and eventually to implement in practice. All right, very good. Well, we'll try to keep on time here. Uh, a very uh, uh, interesting and evolving topic, intraannular versus superannular valve considerations, uh, especially in lieu of the uh, recent Portico data. Uh, Axel Linke. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. So when we select a valve, there are basically patient-specific considerations and center-specific considerations. So a patient-specific consideration is a you know, type of valve. Do we have a tricuspid or bicuspid valve? The distribution of the calcium, the presence of coronary disease, and the anatomy of the aorta um, might lead to a specific valve type you're willing to implant, you're having to implant. On the other side, there are center-specific considerations like local practice, there's operator training, there's medical center experience, and there's availability of, of different valve types. I think it doesn't make sense if you have a special patient and to use a specific valve type, and you don't use this valve type the whole year, just for one case. So this is gonna be an inferior outcome. So with regard to the valve type, you have different options. It, this is self-expandable with an intraannular valve function, the self-expandable with the supraannular valve function, it's balloon expandable with an intraannular valve function, and it's basically an actively expanded valve with a subannular valve function. So this is the options you can choose from. So why is this important? So with a self-expandable intraannular uh, function, you, there may be higher gradients because the valve is actually where the old calcified leaflets are, and they might not be pushed aside enough. If you have a balloon expandable intraannular valve, it's about the same. There is interference with the calcium potentially, and the struts have a certain thickness, so this might reduce um, the valve uh, orifice area as well. With the actively expandable valves, they are usually in a subannular position. The LVOT is usually the smallest in this in anatomy in between the LVOT, the um, annulus, and the uh, ascending order. So in this regard, the self-expandable um, supraannular valve should give you the best hemodynamic result, in theory. Um, on the other hand, the shortcoming of the self-expandable supraannular valve is that coronary excess might be impaired. And this is especially important when it comes to redo procedures. When you do treating low-risk younger patients, the valve is going to fail in 15 to 20 years, and you have to do a redo procedure. Um, if you do this in this kind of valve, you will never have coronary excess again. And in all of the other valve types, this is maintained. So when you treat the patient, you have to think about this. So with the portico, we have a low-profile delivery system, as just shown. 
um, we have um, relatively large valve stru um, strut structure uh, with the diamond cells that allow for engagement of big guiding catheters. You basically have only a little bit of protrusion into the LVOT with less interference potentially with the conduction system. And the valve function is, is really intra-annular except you're implanting the valve very high up. And the valve comes with four different um, sizes. The valve is fully recapturable, repositionable, and retrievable. Um, you have heard about the um, alternative valve that were used in the randomized trial, and we're going to come back to this um, later again. So in this study, 750 patients got randomized to the portico valve or commercially available valves. And um, the valve split was about 65% um, of balloon expandable valves and 35% and, uh, of uh, self-expandable valves. And if you look at the hemodynamics, there's, there's a difference. So with the commercially available valves, you have a little bit of a lower orifice area and you have a little bit higher mean gradient as compared to the portico valve. So when you break it down to the balloon expandable versus the self-expandable valve, you're seeing that the difference is primarily driven by the balloon expandable intraannular valves. Though they have clearly a little higher gradient, they have a smaller um, orifice area. There's no difference basically between the portico valve and the core valve, which means despite of the fact that the portico is sitting, sitting intraannularly, you have a very excellent hemodynamic profile, and you have no problems in having redo procedures. Shortcoming at the moment is a little bit that you have more of a parvalvular leak with the current generation of the portico as compared to the other valves. So this tells you the presence or absence of parvalvular leak predominantly has nothing to do with how you implant the valve um, or what kind of valve type it is it has something to do with additional sealing structures that are missing at the moment in the portico valve, but they are coming with the next generation. So in summary, in conclusion, there are patient and center-specific factors which will impact on valve type selection. Patient factors, center and operator volume will impact on the outcomes. Self-expandable valves seem to have a better hemodynamic profile with lower gradients and higher valve orifice areas. If the patient has significant CAD with a previous intervention or with a high likelihood of an intervention in the future, a heart valve should be selected that allows for good coronary access in the future. And if there's a likelihood that the patient will require a redo, for instance, young patients, patients on dialysis, the first um, uh, top valve should be one with an intraannular or subannular valve function that allows for good redo and coronary access in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. So uh, it's, it's time now to uh, wrap up all this discussion. I think uh, I would like also to, to remind you that this is an open uh, session. You can ask questions you have, if you have doubts, if you have suggestions for us, if you have a different way of thinking. It's open for comments from the audience. I will, be, I will be very happy to hear somebody. See, there is already one person. Please. Thank you. I'm Dr. Javid from Pakistan. I have one question regarding your presentation. Uh, sorry, I don't recall your name. That uh, you have uh, uh, said that ideally repositioning of well has a theoretical risk that you can get end up with uh, uh, permanent pacemaker implantation. But do, ha do we have data to support your data statement? No, that's not based on, on uh, pure data. But I mean, typically, if, if you reposition, it can be both either you're too high or too low. But uh, let's say you have two low implants. Sometimes by just having this and repositioning, uh, just from clinical experience, you induce a block. And it sometimes, sometimes nev never recovers. So I that's the only reason why I say hmm. if, you, if you go into the procedure, it's bad to go with the mental states. Okay, it's a repositionable valve. Let's let's take it less serious for the first implant. I think even though I ha can reposition, I go always. I try to aim for my first implantation. That's spot on. That was the only thing. But I, I agree. I don't have. But I think there's you know if you're going back into the, into history when the first valves were on the market that were not recapturable. When you were implanting, you were always afraid to have a pop up. 
So what people started, they started low and tried to pull it up, and often it did not work. So in the first generation self-expandable, we had pacemaker rates of 30%. Nowadays, we are not you know, shy of starting high, because if we pop up, we have the opportunity to go low. And I think this is a difference, right? That you, if you start low, there's a lot of interference with the conduction system, even if it's temporarily. You're scratching there, there are micro, micro bleeds or inflammation. And um, if you start high up, you avoid the conduction system, I think then you have lower pacemaker rate. Hi, Eduardo Saad from Brazil. Uh, commissurum, uh, commissurum alignment is an important issue for us as, as surgeons. Uh, what do you think about the current device? Is it possible to try to do some commissural alignment in, in, in uh, uh, respect of uh, future coronary assessment or even uh, uh, tower in tower? And what do you think about the industry uh, uh, relying and uh, focusing on this issue in the future? So first of all, I see you already, you are ready to the answer, but uh, thank you, you know, comment from a surgeon, very critical point, I think, today. Uh, thank you for the question. So is it no, uh, I mean, possible, first of all, is it important, number one, or what do you think? Is it important in Portugal, because it's uh, different from others, and is it possible? Well, first of all, I think it's very important for sure if you think you're treating a younger patient. I mean, I'm maybe not so concerned for the first TAVI that goes in, if you have commissural alignment, yes or no, but especially if you do a redo TAVI, and you, yeah, then it's uh, definitely an issue also. But that's a topic we have been investigating. Unfortunately, for the portico, we're now uh, retrospectively analyzing CTs and our implants and pulse CTs to see if there's a pattern in how we can, but it's still an ongoing project, but we're working on it and see, it like they do now with the Evolute, with the head cap, if you have it on the outer curve, then the Gilbert Tang um, from Mount Sinai, he proved that you can reduce your commissural misalignment dram drastically. But for Portico, so we're working on this. We try to, to get a feel on if we can op optimize this, but we don't have the final data. No. I mean, basically, there is one valve that allows for com commercial alignment, uh, which is the Yena valve. It's uh, currently tested in, in clinical trials, predominantly for AR. But with this valve, you, you can do commercial alignment when you're grabbing the old leaflets and you engage them in between the, the um, um, arms and the stand frame. This is one thing. We did it initially in the transapical cases, trying to align the frame that, uh, that it was you know, commercial alignment as for the native valve. I think from coming from the groin, you need special features to do this. And it's associated with additional manipulation because when you move up the catheter, it starts to turn by nature, and then you have to turn it back. And I don't know what the risk is of turning the catheters into the right position. But right now, like, like let's say the, the, the tech technique that uh, Gilbert Tang is using, he tries to optimize his, uh, his rotation in the descending aorta, make a uh, statement there that the, uh, the head cap is, should be on the outer curve, and then he confirms that in 85, 90% of cases, this, this cap stays at the outer curve when you cross the arch. But yeah, it's an interesting thing we, we should look at. Yeah. It's a, good, it's a good question, and you know, unfortunately, there is no Maurizio here, because Maurizio is working on that, and he has an answer, I don't remember what, he has an answer, but I don't remember the answer. So you ask Maurizio Taramasso, right? he's working on that. I think, you know, if I had an answer, please, Abbott, put a marker on, on the, uh, on the commissure post on the non-coronary science, because we go actually in that commissure all the time, you know, we implant this valve starting from the, the commissure between non and right coronary science. It would be nice to have a marker. So we have an idea now. We will be, we'll be called the uh, uh, Portico Com C, C, commissure, whatever. So only two questions from the audience. Everything else is, is uh, easy. So then uh, it's time for a wrap up from uh, our friend uh, from the other side of the ocean again. I'm so jealous about what <laughs> you're doing, guys. All right. Well, first of all, a big thank you to Abbott for sponsoring a great session and, and also to uh, the panelists and speakers. <coughs> really was uh, some fascinating topics and, and it's really exciting to see that this, uh, yet another technology is coming uh, to be available. Again, in, uh, it's not available here in Europe, but uh, the expectation is that FlexNav will achieve CE mark uh, by mid-December. Uh, just, to, just to review again, the uh, FlexNav delivery system is a significantly smaller profile than the uh, first generation. The stability layer allows for uh, more precise delivery. The integrated rage sheath uh, or inline uh, technology, as we're used to calling it, um, is certainly helpful. 
Uh, hydrophilic coating <coughs> has been added, and um, several of the early implanters have described it uh, as, as being uh, almost scary. It's, it's so slick the way it goes through uh, the, the, um, the aorta and, and delivered into the root. Uh, the handle is nicely redesigned. Uh, a few important features that have changed, uh, specifically around the locking mechanism and also uh, the indicator that you've achieved 80% um, of uh, de delivery. And it's very controllable, flexible uh, overall. So as I mentioned, CE mark for the FlexNav is uh, planned for mid-December. Um, the Portico FlexNav in the U.S. Uh, we're hoping t uh, sometime uh, in by second quarter of 2020. And the new valve, uh, next generation, which is being rebranded to be called Navator. You almost have to use your, a big voice to say Navator, right? It's like, it sounds something like very important. But uh, it's gonna be in 2021, hopefully. Uh, there's a 120 patient trial that's been initiated uh, with sites in Europe, Australia, and the United States. So hopefully that'll enroll quickly with a 30-day follow-up. Um, and then um, by, by the end of the year, everything should be submitted to the notified bodies and FDA, and we're hoping the next generation valve, which has a number of, uh, of new features. As you can see here, the active outer cuff uh, has, a, has a PVL uh, sealing feature, which will hopefully further reduce uh, the PVL rates uh, for moderate and severe PVL. Um, the nitinol has been retuned, I guess is the term used now uh, in, for the engineers, to optimize radial force, give a little more force where it's needed, and possibly soften the forces uh, where it's not. Uh, there's a curved aortic frame section, so at the very top, uh, to uh, minimize the chance of aortic injury during deployment or repositioning. And the annulus range is from 19 to 27. The cells remain uh, large, so only slight changes in the, uh, the geometry, and uh, the valve remains intraannular. There's early uh, functionality, as we've seen with the first generation portico without, without uh, pacing required. Oh, I'm not sure we need the music here, but uh, yeah, thank you. So, <laughs> or you want the music? Okay, let's have the music back. Looks like a Godfather music. Yeah. <laughs> so here you can see uh, the valve uh, being delivered, and in, in the in the inset here is, is the locking mechanism. Um, once the valve gets to eighty percent, the lock button comes up, and you can feel some speed bumps on the on the when you rotate the blue dial, and you have to push it if you have to, if you decide to recapture um, the locking mechanism or reset for you. Biggest, obviously, the biggest difference uh, visually here is that the, you can see the, uh, the skirt, which is dynamic initially until, um, number one, the, the anticoagulation is reduced, but uh, with time, uh, these little pockets are able to get into the interstices around the, around the annulus and fill those uh, small spaces. A lot of different uh, ideas for PBL solution. This uh, seems to have a very effective immediate uh, effect on PBL, but also a sustained effect um, is uh, what should happen as well. So very exciting to see both the new generation uh, valve around the corner and also the delivery system. Uh, the, as I mentioned, this trial has been initiated in um, three geographies, US, Europe, and Australia, and 120 patients, including some roll-ins. Uh, this includes the, the flex nav delivery system as well as the new uh, Navator valve in 23 through 29 sizes. The primary safety endpoints all cause mortality at 30 days. Primary effectiveness endpoint is freedom from PVL of greater than mild at 30 days. Uh, and there would be follow up, of course, at 30 days is the primary endpoint, but uh, six months, one year, and annually up to five years. So I think this is a little bit of a liberal, um, uh, sorry, a little conservative at projected enrollment going through Q3 next year. Hopefully this uh, trial will be enrolled early in 2020. Uh, here are the sites. Um, so far, and in Europe, we know we have had an implant uh, recently in uh, Copenhagen with uh, Lars and Ole, and a number of sites in the United States as well. <clears throat> so here were the first implants. Uh, it was actually happened down under in, in Australia, in Perth and Adelaide, and then, as I mentioned, uh, just recently in, in uh, Copenhagen. So what's the pipeline of the flex nav delivery system? We've covered pretty well here, uh, as well as the Navator valve, but also there's a large valve that's uh, in, um, on the pathway to being added to the portfolio. Uh, it'll be called a 35 valve, and uh, it is able to take the um, annulus up to 30 millimeter and also perimeter up to 95, so quite large uh, patients indeed. So that should be a, a great addition to the armamentarium. So once again, I'd like to thank you all for your attention and thank Abbott for uh, sponsoring a, a wonderful session. Uh, have a great day. Thank you very much.